Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals of this beautiful planet. Eric and Mark here with you guys. Day three action getting going at the World Championship. And we, unironically, getting matchups that you might have laughed at in uh, heading up to these play-in stage. But it's a, it's a full marine theme matchup. Team Wales versus the Flying Oysters delivering us the best game and best series so far of Worlds 2023? Crazy. We're getting the variety, my man. We've already been eating good for these past two days, having live games. And now they're saying, let's change up the diet. Give you a bit of seafood with that matchup coming through with the oysters and whales. This was actually a really fun day. Day three, I think that we got uh, some good action to talk about. Of course, still building up to that ultra peak that I think that we're going to reach in these play-ins before we get to the main stage as far as the quality of the games. But still, some good back and forth, some good, exciting League of Legends to talk about. Yeah, and it started with, you know, a pretty calm, cool, controlled PCS game one win for the Oysters, uh, culminating in an absolute disgusting wombo combo out of the Rel Nar Oriana for them to secure that first game. Oh, baby. And you can't forget about that Gnar in the top side, making sure that there was also some extra damage, some extra beef when you're going into the Mega Gnar form for the Oysters. Really like how they stepped forward in this series right away, taking control of the game and pretty much from the, uh, from all the way through, holding that position of power in the game where they were able to dictate what was going on, how the conditions were going to be at all of these objective fights, being the first ones to set up these type of things. Really good, really clean from these Oysters in that first game. Problem is, Wales still had the momentum from upsetting BDS and the secret sauce of going down game one and finding their comfort zone because it was honestly a similar script uh, out of BDS. They come back with a dominant game two where they look very clean. And yes, they're not stomping any of their wins, Team Wales, but they're in control. They're methodical closing things out. It looked good. Getting that bounce back in this second game, you're looking across the board at the champions, the difference makers. I think number one, you're identifying, of course, getting Artemis, that Zaya, one of the very top ADC picks that we are seeing and one that he has shown at this Worlds to be in tip top shape, dishing out those feathers. And then of course, in the jungle, the other one I'm looking at is that J4, Mr. Jarvin, and what he has been able to do, uh, Bean J and making sure that it is that disruptor. He's always getting on to the enemy team, always containing them, corralling them, and dishing it out. I like what I saw in this game too, to push us to, of course, that deciding game. And what a decider it was. This one is the one you're marking. If you can only watch one game from the day, of day three. This is the best game that we've had at World so far. I know it's day three. We're not very far in, but you got to get that claim at some point. This was incredibly back and forth from one of the sneakiest barons uh, for Team Wales to who were kind of behind. They weren't behind a ton, but they were in the back seat or in the passenger seat before this baron sneak where they finally took the game over. Oh, man, the Baron sneak, one of those ones you always got to be keeping track of. Oh, man, you know, I haven't seen this guy in, in any of these side lanes, any of these lanes in a little bit. Oh, where's the jungler? All these little things you got to keep track of. Otherwise, you get a fast one pulled on you by Team Wales to make sure they get that one. And yes, that Baron power play does vault them back in to that position of power in the series, in the game. And from there, they do find a way to close it out. The power pick of that mid lane Oriana making that magic happen for Team Wales. Yeah, I mean, Glory was playing fantastic, uh, but Jimmy and on the other side also had a fantastic uh, individual performance as he has all split long or all tournament long. But these were some incredible back and forth team fights. These teams were completely evenly matched. Even when Team Wales did get an advantage, all of a sudden CFO was getting an ace on the other side. Uh, so both squads very evenly matched. And these are these are second seeds. We're so used to talking about you know these wild card regions as even the top seeds maybe not having what it takes against the main stage. But these are second seeds showing up, putting up internationally, representing their regions with I mean straight up pride. And game one and two build it up. Game three is the one that fully delivers for me on looking at these second seeds and realizing that, of course, you know what? 
they're done feeling out how it's going to be on this stage, at this world, the attention, the meta, all these things. They're done kind of in that cautious feeling type of stage. They're locked in. They are ready for these games. They are prepared and they are performing at that type of level. That's where you start to see these dramatic pushback game threes that we had in this series. Super looking forward to what these two can cook up still remaining in these play-ins, even with Wales, of course, continuing on in the upper half and CFO now going down into that lower bracket. And now, I mean, GAM is a forgotten afterthought in terms of the BCS because we are full steam ahead on the hype for Team Wales. You started this play-in stage before we even knew if it was going to be BDS or Golden Guardians matching up against them, and it was like, whatever. They're gonna beat either squad will handle Team Wales and advance to the next round. But here they are back to back. Game three clutch performances, the underdog in both series. And I mean, you can highlight, I think mid ADC, Artemis and Glory are the main guys to talk about. BJ's had some fantastic performances as well. But how about this series after getting embarrassed by Adam? Sparta had a fantastic bounce back, especially that Aatrox in the third game. He says, no Darius, no Garen. I will get the job done. Yes, a big bounce back from Mr. Sparta in the top side. It's fantastic because you're looking at what Wales has done and the expectations that they're beating and now setting for themselves in this type of situation as a second seed. You then put that fire onto the Marines and say, why haven't you been able to deliver? Why haven't you been able to play the way that you should play? type of thing or showing us that you are able to play and like to play in your own region Wales bringing that to the forefront here at this event now it is time for the Marines to do that and it's not just about they're in that do or die type of situation you got to do and you got to impress as you're doing it for me for the Marines and they got a long road to get there but again now they are set up team Wales they're that first seed from uh, group B, they're waiting for whoever can come through that loser's bracket. And Gam, they're going to have their work cut out for them. Have to win two in a row, best of threes, to even get to that point. But that is that is the star storyline now that you're looking for to have that civil war. And for Gam to maybe find a level of comfort if they've won two best of threes and then see a Vietnamese team waiting for them in that qualification match. Sure, it's that reaction of, you know, okay, we were able to handle these guys domestically. We see them succeed internationally. Why can't we be that answer? Why can't we raise our game to that type of level? Sure, is that check, but I think it's still one of those things. You look at the success domestically, the accomplishments of this Gigabyte Marines roster, and you go, you shouldn't even need that type of extra incentive, that extra type of motivations, figuring out how to play, how to be aggressive on this international stage. We're cut out for them, but we'll see how they do in that lower spot. But yes, congratulations, Team Wales. Great job setting the pace and earning yourself some new fans, I think, already at this event. And, you know, we're seeing, again, very early days, three days in. But that first initial teaser for this playing stage, you heard all these teams talking about DRX's run last year inspired us to think anything is possible. I'm not saying Team Wales is going to win Worlds, guys, <laughs> but I feel like... These teams almost have renewed confidence that, you know what, even though everyone's doubting us, we don't doubt ourselves. We know what we're capable of, and we can come and actually make noise at this event and look at the boys now. Yeah, and it's one of those things where absolutely you can get lost in the sauce of kind of going, okay, yeah, they're going to run into something eventually, and that's going to be that answer for them that they can't get over that miracle run type of thing. Got to remember, this is going to be Swiss stage. This is our first time with this new format this is one of those formats that can allow for an unbelievable underdog to make one of these miracle runs and get it together a little bit easier, I think, than some of the restrictions, some of the roadblocks that you would run into with the old format. So don't lose all that hopium about the whales and what they might be able to do damage even further on than the playing state. Winning any game is going to have a huge impact on the bracket. There's no throwaway games in this new Swiss format. That was the highlight of the day, but heading into it, the marquee matchup was supposed to be PSG versus Loud in that other best of three. And, you know, game one, very competitive, lived up to it. PSG looked like they were going to run away with the game. And then some super clean team fighting out of Loud and specifically uh, Route on the Sivir. They get an ace to get them back into this game. You get an ace to get right back into it. Unfortunately, too good from Mr. Route because it, you know, not only was it good enough that everybody in the arena is going, oh my goodness, look at that Sivir, look at that damage coming through, that was great. The other team did, and they realized that, you know what, 
we got to get on to this Sivir and absolutely right down by the dragon pit. They find an opportunity as soon as the Nico out lands. They are all on top of that Sivir, making sure that she ain't dishing up that damage no more. Yes, this is a game that we did see that fight back, that push back from Loud after PSG built up a little bit of an advantage for themselves and, you know, maybe made a mistake here or there and Loud was absolutely right there to capitalize on make it that thing where we were a little bit interested as this game got towards the later parts of it but still uh, relatively controlled or at least powerful advantage type of win for psg how about these nico engages we've been getting out of maple so far in this tournament he has far and away looked the most comfortable at that pick uh which is the most picked uh mid lane champion so far at worlds the most accomplished, most experienced mid laner at Worlds delivering to that type of level that you expect, that you want to see, the type of level that is required to push your team from the play-in stage into the main stage. That's what we are seeing from Maple really taking the charge. Yes, that Nico pick that we are seeing from so many people, the angles that he has, that mastery of making sure that it's not just, oh, you know, I'm caught out. Let me panic, try and push my ultimate here. These no, none of that's going on with Maple. It's all under control, and he has been fantastic on that Nico pick. And game one lived up to maybe the hype competitively. Game two, PSG looked angry, and we've been excited about every game that Robo has played so far, but the Malphite into the Kennen matchup was not the excitement CB Law fans were looking for. No, and it was really unfortunate because with as much of back forth that we did get in that first game where you did have both sides of the arena, which there were fans for both of them there. Loud, loud fans. And then, of course, the PSG fans were there. We were getting both of them cheering back and forth. A good play here, a good play there, all those type of things. Game two, there was only one type of play happening, and that was good plays for the side of PSG. And there was no noise coming through from the loud faith. Uh, Junjia has been the best jungler so far at Worlds. I think it's easy to lock that one in. We got to see that really highlighted in that second game. He was still good in the first game, too, in that matchup against Croc. And then it's just another double-digit Kaisa kill game for Wako in the bot lane, who has been an absolute machine. And this is one of the matchups that I was looking at specifically in this series, looking at the bottom lane, looking at these two, Wako and Routen, how they had both been really some high level players for their teams and contributing that important damage and ability there. Uh, you didn't really see enough of it, I think, in the second game from Route. There's other issues with Loud that happen that can contribute to that. But you are positive on the side of Wako, who I think is carving out his position, his name in this playing stage, at least as the most most lethal or arguably the most lethal ADC that is here. And how many times have we seen him have above 300 CS at like 25 minutes? It's absolutely insane. I know they're probably feeding him CS, but uh, especially on that Zaya and Kaisa, he has been absolutely insane. So Kai, uh, PSG sitting pretty as that first seed in Group A opposite of Team Wales. And now, again, we're kind of assuming that Gam should beat R7 because that's, that's a real disaster if they fall out there, which means... You're likely getting the rematch against Loud, who are going to be angry after that game two shellacking that they got from PSG. Oh, it should make a very great series because both of them should be angry then. You got Loud looking to rebound after the way PSG is dispatched them. And then, of course, the Marines. Yes, they got to first get through Rainbow Seven. And I think we're at the point, obviously, super low on our confidence with the Marines, where you're saying it's not a guarantee at least for R7. You do need to show up. You do need to take care crossing your eyes, you know, dotting your T's, all these type of things, making sure that you're getting across the finish line to that next stage is the big thing for the Marines. Yes, PSG is this number one seed coming on through. It sets up that inevitable for BDS if they're able to make it on through matchup against arguably the toughest team here in the plains. And that's their best case scenario now is getting a best of against PSG to advance. I think before everyone, most people at the very least were saying, BDS and PSG should be the two teams going through. Well, that ain't happening, folks. Only one of them is getting through to that Swiss stage. And BDS going to have to level up from that Team Wales series if they want a chance against PSG. Yeah, just flat out. And I think it's going to be one of these things where I don't want the, you know, all the talk and everything about Adam because he is such an, a you know, big figure, big important piece of the BDS puzzle. But you see what went wrong for BDS 
wasn't the Adam situation. It was a lot of the other stuff that didn't step up to that type of level, wasn't ready or able to handle that pressure, that skill that was coming across. It's got to level itself up here because it's, if it's just Adam, I don't think that that's enough to carry you all the way through. Never mind when you get to that destination match against PSG to try and carve out your own fate. Luckily for B BDS, I feel like there's a lot of things to clean up, even just when it comes to pick ban. Number one, uh, the priority and urgency that Ezreal was giving you is not enough. And that's that's more the champion even than Crowny. I think you want him on some... Get him on these OP picks right now in the, the 80 carry spot and he can take over some games. And even Adam, after that dominant Darius game, he was just left to, you know, play Renekton in a couple more games. You got to put some more emphasis on the guy who just completely poo-pooed on the opposing top later in game one. I think you got two ways you can go. And that was kind of what we saw in that series was, okay, we did get the Darius game and then we pivot to something else. And then it was, okay, well, you now you really need to pivot to something in this game three and it was doubling down on safety, on traditional, conventional type of thing, as opposed to leaning in to the strengths, unique individualness of your players. And I think right now, yes, that is one of these, you know, balancing boards where sometimes you go too far into it, it leaves you exposed to what is there in the meta, all these type of things. But with a player like Adam, with a composition around BDS and where you play to your strengths, play to this unique champion pool, play to those strong things that you know how to do, if it gets busted, it gets blown up, it doesn't work, you're going to have to rebound either way. I think that that's the way that this BDS team can play at their very best, and we didn't see that in the back, back half of that series that they ended up losing. Yeah, it feels like they thought they did enough to kind of knock out Team Wales after that game one, but ain't nobody quitting in Worlds, and that was a hard lesson that BDS, I think, will have learned going forward. Only three days in, but you still got to take your every couple of days snapshot of the meta. So far at this world, some somewhat surprising picks when you go across uh, all uh, the roles so far. And I want to start, start top lane because this is the most talked about one. Renekton has been the most picked. Not only is he the most picked top laner so far, but Mark, he's 1-8. and eight. eight out of nine games this champion has lost. Why are you still getting picked? <laughs> oh, the fossil of the top lane. I love Renekton. I'm a fan of alligators or crocodiles. Whoever you slice it up, I'll take them. But Renekton right now is looking like a handbag out there in the top side. And I say handbag because you're taking it and you're taking the cash from it as you're picking up the kill is the way the enemy team is treating this lizard. Uh, it's one of these ones where you look at how he can play, what he can offer for the team, what he traditionally offers in this sense, and you can understand the pick. You look at the numbers, you look at the results, you realize the other opportunities, the other champions that are available, that are in the meta right now. Kind of questionable and unfortunate that we do see this Renekton at this type of presence. You feel like it's going to get pivoted away from, and I'm still waiting for some of the more spicy picks. I mean, we already had Darius and Garen, so that's plenty spicy, guys. But just whatever it is, encounter to Cassante or anything. But yeah, less Renekton going forward. Uh, when you look at mid-jungle, I think... The surprise, not that they've been picked, but they've been up there as the most prominent picks are Jarvin and Oriana. Again, we've seen these picks kind of throughout. Oriana is one of the picks that survives the test of time in the meta, but she is being heavily prioritized right now. And it feels good, my man. Maybe not the Jarvan one as much for me, but the Oriana one. I'm very happy to see her return to this type of thing. It is almost... Every couple of months, every year or so, she does creep herself right back into a prime position in the meta. Has been a little bit since we have seen her rise up to the tippity top of the SS tier type of rankings. The ultra contested pick, she's there right now and we are seeing those results. You saw those today in the matches that we just talked about already. And then that Jarvan pick is one that I think has been kind of hanging around here or there this past year looking to kind of break through and establish as a top tier option i think that's what's happening now the way that he is able to play the pathing the options that he provides in these team fights this is a champion that is in top top requirements for worlds yeah and pre-15 minutes we've seen him completely take over games obviously as soon as he hits six even before six has such high gank potential guys are building a little bit more damage than we're accustomed to seeing on that j4 pick so that's a again we're, we're fishing but jungle has actually been the most 
diverse picks so far. I think 10 different junglers have already been played. It's not just Maokai duty over and over again. The most stale so far has probably actually been in the bot lane. When you look at supports, it's, you know, kind of more of the same. Rel is still very strong. Obviously, uh, you know, Alistair, at least it's more engaged champions. And then at the very top, going tandem with these 80 carries, is Zaya Rakan as a duo. Because when Zaya is broken, Rakan is broken. And Kaisa, Kaisa and Zaya have played 17 out of the 28 picks so far. They are running away with the tournament so far. And it's usually one or the other, Zaya or Rakan, that kind of pulls the other one along into the meta, into pro play. They're never really all that far away from it as well. But yes, this is one of those situations, and more often than not, it's been the Rakan, actually, that is pulling Zaya into the situation, making her better. But right now, where Zaya fits with the ADCs, her and Kaisa are the very tippity top options, and you want to bring that Zaya up to a higher level, you want to give a little buff to your support as well, that's where that Zaya Rakan synergy comes through. And I think it's been That's a where it's bit dangerous so when they're both too strong, right? Because then and that duo been, is. Poof. And it's been so long that I think a lot of people are forgetting about that inherent built-in synergy. Those little buffs that they get for playing together. That's the big one for me with Zaya Rakan. And it's absolutely one of these extra advantages that comes through when they're both in a strong enough position in the meta. Right now with Zaya in a super strong position and Rakan being okay does make that change happen through in the bot lane for sure and it feels like you know we've had so many little twists and turns when it comes to itemization for 80 carries over the last couple of months now we're seeing this lethality kaisa i mean we're seeing three different types of kaisa builds these days and to varying levels of success but most of them are absolutely deadly so assuming as this event goes on i mean zaya is one of two champions that has been 100 percent pick band so far throughout i think it's going to stay near that throughout this event but as we develop there's going to be more picks that come up to try and counter pick both kaisa and zaya we're only three days in but a little bit more uh, diversity in terms of champion picks than i think a lot of people were expecting that is it today though for league unlock eric and mark here with you beautiful people from day three action at worlds we will catch you on that flippity flip